This problem is one of the few scientists to specifically think that aesthetics is worthy of direct consideration by a biologist. So he's going to explain what the whole controversy is right now. Thanks a lot. First of all, thanks so much for the invitation, David, and uh, exciting to be in this, uh, in this cabinet and uh, to uh, mm. talk a little bit about the wonder cabinets uh, of, of, of the birds, uh, as we saw in all those bower birds. Um, uh, I'm enthused to hear Gail's talk. She's done a fantastic job. She's going to shorten a lot of stuff that I won't have to say or I can refer to, so it's been very, very efficient. I'm also really enthused that we might have a second convert in science who's really interested in using aesthetics in, uh, in, a, in an evolutionary context. So, so maybe, so maybe, so maybe that's a, that we're moving in that direction. Um, I'm an ornithologist with a long-term interest in the evolution of, of courtship display. And in my own research uh, has been a, uh, uh, a wild ride. I find that uh, over many years now, spending a lot of time in the jungles, plenty of time at electron microscopes, studying uh, the beauty of birds at many levels, uh, that I have uh, uh, been developing uh, new thoughts in this area and, and really resonating with some very old thoughts, original thoughts on, on sexual selection. So I'm going to try to introduce some of those today. Um, uh, Gail did an excellent job of, uh, of starting off with the, the conundrum that faced this guy, Charles Darwin. Um, he looks worried in that photo, and I think uh, that's, that's the feeling he got after he looked at a peacock feather, the sickness. Uh, the fact is he had, uh, had developed a powerful theory of natural selection to describe the origin of form and function in nature, this, uh, and, and, and believed very strongly in it. But he was faced with some incredible challenges, and one of them was the obvious aesthetic traits, the beautiful things in nature. Uh, that organisms possess that obviously have no function in furthering their survival. Like this courtship display of the Wayne's Ferodia, a bird of paradise from New Guinea, filmed by one of my students uh, at Scholes. Um, so um, rather than uh, merely sit on his laurels, uh, the aging, older Darwin spent years uh, in development of a new theory, and, and as he perceived, an independent hypothesis for another mechanism for the evolution of form, function, and design in nature, which he called sexual selection. And so, of course, uh, sexual selection has two parts, the, the uh, uh, competition within, within one sex for control over access to the others, usually male-male competition, and uh, mate choice, and, and uh, usually, though not entirely, found uh, within females. So we can have situations with mutual mate choice, or where, indeed, males are choosing among, among ornamented females. But it's mate choice, or the enactment of, of mating preferences, that Darwin hypothesized lead to the evolution of ornament in, 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 in organisms. And Dale's doing a very good job of outlining that. What I want to <coughs> emphasize is that Darwin's original language uh, for this was extremely aesthetic. He described mating preferences as a taste for the beautiful or as an aesthetic faculty. He described the traits that males evolved as having the power to charm the female. Now, over the decades, and over now almost more than 140 years, people have uh, usually read those words uh, as being uh, dusty old Victorian language, right? Uh, a little too colorful. Uh, and indeed, uh, um, Darwin's aesthetic enthusiasm in, or in, in, in evolutionary biology is like the crazy aunt in the attic. We don't really talk about that. And then now we have, we have this big set of bicent you know, bicentennial of Darwin. And I can find no particular writings that actually celebrate this, this aspect of Darwin's work. And it was a huge aspect of his work. He thought it was basically the final chapter of his work. Um, in addition, another detail, this is uh, more for the, for the biologist, another aspect of his theory is that it was explicitly co-evolutionary. That is, he's, he, he believed that it was both the, the traits of the males and the perceptions, the preferences of the, of the, of the females that were co-evolving. They were entrained historically and evolving with one another over time. So in this uh, quote, he says, the male Argus pheasant acquired his beauty gradually through the preference of the females during many generations for the highly ornamented males. The aesthetic capacity of females advanced through exercise or habit, just as our own case gradually improved. Now, he didn't have a genetic mechanism. He didn't have a complicated uh, uh, aspects of mathematical models of sexual selection that we now have, but these are certainly as accurate as his descriptions of the process of natural selection, which most biologists think is prescient. 
But this aspect was extremely controversial. One of the things that was most controversial about Darwin's proposal was the idea that he was talking about sexual <coughs> autonomy, the independent agency of female individuals to determine the outcome of mating as an evolutionary force in nature. Right? I, I still think that that's an incredibly <coughs> radical idea. Uh, and I, and, I, and, and uh, I think that the aesthetic mode of thinking about sexual selection is one that will bring that back to the center of science and, and to explanatory power. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the notion of sexual autonomy as an evolutionary force was, was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, well, it was highly criticized immediately. People thought animals could not make these choices. Uh, uh, there were even some blatantly misogynistic criticism at the beginning that, well, women will want one thing one minute, one minute the next thing yeah. another. How do you ever get to the peacock's tail by any such process, right? Uh, and, uh, and sort of the Brownian motion of the female mind hypothesis, right? And, and, and uh, indeed, the, the, the antagonism to Darwin's, uh, this hypothesis Darwin was, was immediate. His main agonist was Alfred Russell Wallace. Alfred uh, uh, was, is famous for having killed the, the, the science of sexual selection for about a century. Um, in, in particular, he, a number of his hypotheses, uh, he, he were quite wacky, but in specific, what he was saying is that natural selection, he believed, would neutralize sexual selection. It was a controlling power. It would basically make it irrelevant. And here's a, um, another quote that's remarkably pressing for modern uh, uh, biologists. The only way in which you can account for the observed facts, these ornaments, it is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. This is the statement that the peacock's tail encodes information the female needs to know about, like, you know, did, does he come from a good egg? Uh, who are his people? Does he have sexually transmitted diseases that I might catch if I prefer him? Um, Etc. It is exactly the hypothesis proposed by uh, uh, Zahavi in the handicap principle a uh, uh, hundred years later, um, uh, but in independence or, or, or entirely in ignorance of, of Wallace. Um, essentially, the Wallacean hypothesis is the idea that natural selection will control the dynamics of, of, of sexual selection so that it uh, makes choices merely the handmaiden, if you will, of adaptation. Right? Darwin and Wallace were real agonists in this regard, and so um, they were, uh, um, uh, 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 and in this quote, Wallace wrote, uh, even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist on the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and therefore I claim for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. <coughs> this is a book called Darwinism, written by Wallace after Darwin has died. And this, so the Darwinism we have today is not the Darwinism of Darwin. It is, it is Wallacean evolutionary biology. And Darwin was, uh, in many ways, a, uh, a radical theorist of sexual autonomy, uh, not the eugenic uh, 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 theorist of, 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 uh, of uh, well, human evolution. So um, um, I'm really eager in science to, uh, to, uh, to expand in aesthetic evolutionism. What I'm going to talk about is briefly as an outline of what aesthetic evolutionary biology would be like. And the first thing we need to uh, distinguish between the process of adaptation in a general way and aesthetic selection or its possible uh, thing. And that's the between, distinction between a physical substrate uh, and a neural or cognitive substrate. So the roots of the plant uh, can be described in their function fully with a complete physical description of the interaction of roots with soil and rock and water, et cetera. Right? So, uh, 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 and, and so we can describe them entirely by adaptive uh, explanations. Um, the flower, on the other hand, functions in the perception uh, by pollinators. Its functional substrate is not the real world, if you will. It is the, it is the, it is the, the, the perceptions of a community of, of pollinators who are uh, comparing of us. So the functional substrate is, if you will, the mind, a population of minds. This is a much more uh, 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 unconstrained place. To be successful within an observing mind versus within a physical problem it, it is quite distinct. So if we, if we turn to birds, of course, we have the famous case of, of Darwin's finches, adaptation in beak shape in response to the physical challenges of cracking a nut or seizing a bug, right? But on the right, we have the plumages of cotingas, which have evolved through their cognitive substrate, right? They are functioning, they're mediated by the real world, but they function in the perception by another mind. And that is a place which is, in and of itself, uh, 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 not as constrained as, as the physical questions. So aesthetic evolution is a research program um, 
that, that deals with this convolutionary process of communication signals and their evaluations, areas where choices are being made, such as made choice, and I would also uh, consider uh, pollination and, 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 and fruit dispersal. And even uh, aposematism or warning coloration like skunks and coral snakes. Um, but uh, I, I, would, I would support, as I think Darwin did it, on his indicator traits, traits that actually encode information about quality should be included as, uh, as, as, as aesthetic. So this, this broad aspect of the aesthetic is uh, aspects of biology have this co-evolutionary uh, uh, aspect to them, um, including uh, honest indicators. Um, I think the recognition of an aesthetic dimension to intersectional signals will, 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 will um, require us to test the adaptive hypotheses, not just to assume them. So most of modern, although Gale uh, uh, mentioned the possibility of, of the sexy sun hypothesis or, or the, the, the sharing models, the indirect benefit of having offspring that are sexually successful, this hypothesis is usually shelved as mathematical curiosity and not as a, as, 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 as a real possibility. These are, these are the modern scientific modes of getting Darwin's uh, ideas to work. Um, uh, essentially, this is the proposal to bring BE back uh, into science, and, uh, and I hope that that word becomes uh, not uh, just in the margins of things we say at symposiums on Saturday, but in the abstract of biology papers of peer reviewed science journals. And so that's, that's the goal here. I want to give a little bit of aesthetic science here. <coughs> Studying aesthetic science means understanding that beauty is not only skin deep, right? Different species, as Gail showed, are evolving different standards of beauty, Darwin's words, uh, to, create, uh, to create new uh, uh, forms of, of communication. In this case, this is a wing sound. That quick, quick wing is a club-winged mannequin from northwest uh, Ecuador, and he's producing a stridulating noise with his wings. Here it is at 500 frames per second. This is the work of Kim Boswick, my grad student who's now at Cornell, uh, showing that the feathers are oscillating over the back of the bird. Uh, and, and here, what happens is that this uh, fifth secondary on the left is bent, and it, 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 it rubs against, as the feathers oscillate, the, the, uh, the large sixth secondary on the right, which have those little ridges. So like running your finger over a comb, it goes bada, 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 and for like mechanical stimulation, to that feather, and it's the sixth secondary, which rings, oscillates to create that sound. This is a cricket mechanism within a bird. This bird has, a, you know, uh, uh, been singing songs, or this lineage has been singing songs for uh, the tens of millions of, of years, and suddenly evolves an entirely new way of communicating uh, because of uh, the uh, the aesthetic preferences of, of female males. Uh, this is another feature showing that if we look at the alma here, this is the, the wing. These are the little quill knobs where the secondary feathers insert on the wing, and uh, they are huge. Uh, this is the most bizarre ulna in aves. If you look at the cross section at the bottom, you see these solid white. Um, these uh, forearm bones have been hollow since Tyrannosaurus rex, right? Uh, these are the only solid ulna, radius and ulna in all of birds, right? Uh, and they are solid because those bones need to be so so solid in order to support the wing feathers that allow for that. Uh, that, that thing to come. So here is within a single unique species, we have an aesthetic preference by females that results in a novelty that is unknown in our ladies. Uh, another aspect of our research that's aesthetic is on structural color. These blues of the catania and the bluebird are actually uh, structural colors. They're made by nanostructures. These are protein and air, uh, air bubble uh, 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 nanostructures within those blue feathers. It's light scattering off of those blue feathers that create the, uh, the colors. And we're actually using x-ray scattering uh, data from Argonne Labs uh, in order to study. So, so we, we have uh, material science support for research on aesthetics. Um, uh, but how do they grow them? In order to make this blue color, those little air channels have to be just the right size and shape in order to make it. If it's um, approximately uh, five or ten millionths of an inch different in size, you get a different color and you are either uh, uh, not preferred, uh, leave no mates or leave no offspring, or you're the best new thing in town and the whole species evolved in that direction, right? Uh, uh, this process of the evolution of, 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 of different norms of beauty is, is, is extremely dynamic. But, but, but now we have an engineering problem. How do they grow this stuff? Well, recently we're studying the, the role of phase separation. On the left, we have a model, a physical model of the, of the unmixing of two materials. Imagine oil and vinegar unmixing, going from a completely mixed state to an unmixed state. They go through uh, the, a, a physical process of separation called phase separation, uh, producing uh, a, uh, a, 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 a shape which is incredibly
increasing in size scale, getting coarser and coarser, but keeping the same general shape. So in order to make a blue feather, we believe that the protein of these feather cells is separating from the cytoplasm, polymerizing, and going through this process. So birds have evolved to co-opt this, this soft condensed matter physics in order to, in order to, to create these nanostructures. They are self-assembled by phase separation. Um, interestingly, the other kind of phase separation that there is is the separation of bubbles and beer. And bubbles and beer are notably round. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the, the Katinga feathers are, are being produced by a bubbles and beer mechanism, and the, uh, and the bluebirds are being produced by an oil and vinegar mechanism. Uh, last example here, this is uh, the Pompadour Katinga, a bird that uh, um, uh, it has been a great pleasure to see at any time that you can possibly see it. Uh, it is a deeply purple bird, and it turns out that this deep purple is made with eight different carotenoid pigments. Uh, these are pigments that are originally acquired from the diet, uh, and, then, and then metabolically transformed by the bird. Last year we described the pigments of, these, of this bird. The top two, uh, number one and number five, were previously known. All the other molecules are entirely new to science. They've never been seen before. There's about 300, 400 different carotenoid molecules known, but these have never been seen. The closest thing are actually in purple sponges. So uh, what we are seeing here is the way in which uh, the birds have evolved to modify these molecules by putting methoxy groups here and, 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 and changing their put. These, these molecules actually act like, literally like uh, uh, guitar strings. They're like a quantum guitar string. So when certain photons come in, they resonate in response to the frequency of the light and absorb some energy and not others. And the result is this purple color. Now, what I'm interested in is the fact that uh, this is a paradigm of honest signaling. The idea is that the that, the, that the, 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 these kind of pigmentary expression, that redder will be better because the male is showing off how much, how good his diet is. But in this case, the male is doing everything he can to obfuscate any possible information in the diet by transforming everything that's in the diet into marvelous new molecules which contribute to a unique display. So how much time do I have? Oh, like five minutes. Five minutes, okay, great. Um, um, you know, I got, I, I started, when I started becoming interested in beauty as a scientific concept, I decided to start reading in aesthetic philosophy. I figured, hey, there's people in the academy who have spent, you know, centuries, millennia thinking about beauty and, and art. Why don't I read what they are saying? And, and uh, I was disappointed to find not a lot of agreement. Uh, there wasn't even agreement on the, how to approach any or most of the fundamental questions. And indeed, I found that, that, that beauty is... Uh, um, it is a topic that, that many, many academics who study uh, the humanities are alienated from. Uh, and I found this quite sad because uh, uh, I'm surrounded by uh, and study the oh, beautiful objects and it's a very fundamental part of my work, but I've known curators who work with ravishingly beautiful pieces of art whose entire academic careers are not focused on that fact or sort of on ignoring that fact. I think that's quite sad. Uh, and, and I think that what I'm hoping to propose, or what, what I ended up doing was trying to uh, have heretical notions that, that there might be contributions uh, from biology to the study of aesthetics and humans. And so I'm currently working on uh, developing and not getting published yet in various <laughs> philosophy journals, uh, work on co-evolutionary aesthetics. And that is where I propose essentially that, that art can be defined as a, as a form of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation. This refers, it's very shorthand, I can't describe it well, but, but basically refers to the entrainment of production and, and choice, right? And that this is characterized, this process could occur in a genetic mechanism, as we see in birds, or, or a cultural mechanism, as we see in, in human cultures, or even in many birds that learn their songs. Uh, what this means is that many forms of uh, bird song, plumage, uh, uh, flowers, fruits, uh, you know, insect uh, communications are biotic art, right? Um, uh, this means as well that there are a myriad of biotic art worlds in addition to the multiple uh, uh, human art worlds, uh, and that uh, these have uh, you know ontogenetic status and can be studied uh, uh, through uh, a natural history, if you will, of aesthetics. Um, lastly, I think that you know just as we see that in the history of uh, cosmology, our own understanding of the universe, uh, the more in which we move human beings outside of the organizing center of knowledge the more our knowledge improved, right? So when humans were at the center of the universe, right, Earth and all the, everything rotating around us, 
uh, then, 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 then we didn't actually know a lot. And as soon as we got them out of the organizing center, we, we started to improve our knowledge. And then it turns out the sun isn't even the center of the universe. It's just a random place in the middle of a random galaxy, right? All that has been knowledge improvement. And I think the same thing is true with aesthetics and perhaps the humanities in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in, in a way. That expanding is the aesthetics to include non-human animals will take human beings and our concerns, our myopic concerns, outside the organizing center of the discipline and will allow us to, 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 to make real progress, not only on, on, on birds, but on us, on ourselves. And, and so that's something I'm, 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 I'm here to do. Uh, I'm going to close uh, with a video taken by my student, again, Ed Scholes. This is the, the, the companion New Guinea radiation. These are the bird paradise. This is the uh, superb bird paradise. Notice that his eye is black, not blue. He's making a mechanical wing snap with his wing. Gail noted uh, 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 aesthetic extremity with aggressive presentation. Right? <laughs> so aesthetic science is going to require that we study birds like that at just unbelievable number of levels. In this case, at the nano scale, defined by those blue feathers being produced, uh, then, and then also uh, at, the, at the behavioral level, environmental level. What's interesting is that this male was not successful. Right, that female flew off. And this, is, and this is really interesting because what we find in nature, and I think probably also true in humans, is that ex extremity of expression is associated with extremity of failure. The reason why there are so few great operas is because they're really, really hard to do well. Right? The reason why there's so much bad poetry is that really good poems are really hard to write. And so the, re the way in which these birds get to be extreme is that most of them fail. Right? And that the choice, the action of sexual autonomy, results in a very few individuals being highly successful. And that leads to the evolution of this extreme. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Rich. We've got time for some questions here. Great. Uh, and uh, I am really hard of hearing, and I had uh, uh, one accident this week where I lost my, my, my hearing aid. So anybody who speaks this kind of like yell out to me or hand on a microphone. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm really interested in your um, idea about the aesthetic within the bird displays and the aesthetic of art. And um, there's a lot about how art works for us in terms of how our eyes move around for painting. Like if, if the eye hangs up in some place, it doesn't keep moving, that's not satisfactory. Um, if, there's, if there's too universal a look around the painting and nowhere focuses, that's not satisfying. So just Gail's um, following the eye would be interesting to compare you know, with what we sort of think generally of these good paintings. So I think that, that there's, a, there's a, a, layer, a layer, an important layer of cognitive science here um, most of the, that has been applied as a constraint, like uh, people find this attractive because we're attracted to symmetry. I think that that mostly is not very explanatory in terms of describing uh, the diversity of art. Uh, but, but these sorts of things are another, another layer that's going to be very uh, interesting. Yes? Um, can, I think very much. Louder, please, yeah. Yes, I thank you very much for this. Oh, now I think it will work, right? And thank you very much, third time, for this highly interesting talk. And from my side, just a small um, remark in regard to the relevance of aesthetics for Darwin. Um, there is a lot of research done from art historians and people from cultural scientists in regard to that, and a lot of books are published mainly in the UK. And um, in regard to what you said with your last example on the failure and expression, I think what we need to keep in mind that what Darwin pointed out was his last book, which he wrote after the death sent of man and the origin of species, is the expression of the emotion in animal and man. And he pointed out that we will never understand the aesthetics of beauty if we don't understand that a certain kind of hobby plays a significant role where emotion, and with that, 
um, what, what kind of aesthetics is going on here, which is not necessarily related to beauty or to art, but to a kind of expression of, of an, emotion, uh, an emotional engagement, yeah. which well, makes it, first of all, that the sex yeah, sexual may, selection one of, the, one, of the reason, happen. one of the reasons why Darwin put that in his second book is because it really didn't fit in right. with sexual selection. Most of the right. emotions he was talking about were outside the context of, of, of intersexual interactions or uh, yeah. and, uh, 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 yeah, in, in the back, sir. So, shouldn't we make a distinction between uh, beauty and art? I mean, certainly, uh, just because something's appealing and has, and has uh, you know, uh, gratifying design, that doesn't make it uh, art. What, so, I think that we're not we're not addressing that distinction. Yeah, the Champs urinal, we wouldn't necessarily be attracted to bucket, you know. So, well, I, I, I've got a lot of thoughts on that. Maybe we can hit it on coffee. Uh, what can I say right now? I think there's great examples from biotic art where the valence, if you will, is different. So a, a king snake, a coral snake, right, which is which is is, is 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 vividly repulsive. That's a brilliant, that's a very venomous snake or a skunk. They're they're repulsive to animals, right? So this is art that are cooked because they those signals co evolve with their responses. These are, 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 are forms of biotic art that are not beautiful. Right, so so nature doesn't just do beauty; it does all this. Uh, this whole leisure process can, can arrive at other other kinds of expression. Um, I think they distinguish well between what is beauty. That's one form of aesthetic function or aesthetic uh, property that co-evolves in an art world uh, versus another. It can be it can be attractive. Uh, I think that's the, probably the best description of, of beauty uh, that that someone who's engaged in wants to maintain that engagement. Uh, it can be repulsive, or uh, or or or, uh, or, or have, you know, birds don't do irony. I don't think, uh, <laughs> but but per, per, perhaps as David mentions in, in one of his books on bird song, there are birds of Europe that mimic other birds. But when they mimic, they are mimicking songs that they heard on the wintering ground in Africa, right? So they they are bringing bird culture from Africa, migrating up Europe, and then in the marshes of Europe, singing bird songs, African bird songs. Now, do the females hear that? Are they nostalgic and thinking? Wow, I remember when. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you got it. That was great. You know, that was kind of like, I like that. I like that. I, like that. I, like that. I feel comfortable with that sound, right? What is that? What is that? Are they having a kind of aesthetic experience that, 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 that like, uh, uh, we, we, we don't know only because we can't communicate with them, uh, uh, not, uh, not because we're, we're certain that that's not possible. Yeah. Like for instance, if you would say, if you would think of nature, that nature really is uh, the movement of the wind, the movement of light, um, etc. <laughs> so, uh, could, could that not be in, in related to the movement of the relationship of, uh, of the, for example, the uh, um, courtship of uh, of the birds and uh, uh, all other relationships? So. Um, uh, I am a visual artist and an educator, and uh, I <coughs> have worked with uh, kinetics, with movement in art, like, such as light and sound, and uh, sculptural objects. And I think that could be very interesting. To, yeah, to I, 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 you know, these these these, these birds are, are, are I, I know the birds are many other examples outside of them, but that they are, I think, uh, exploit they're uh, manipulating art or light in complicated ways with nanostructures that are evolved to, to create colors or, or brilliance or darkness. Uh, in this in this display, uh, one of the notable things is that that whole area around the blue happy face of, of uh, right, was was uh, was uh, made of, of of nanostructures that are incredibly flat black, right? And so here we have the coordination of movement. We have muscles evolved that have evolved to erect the feathers. The feathers have to be of certain lengths. We have a, uh, uh, exquisitely flat black and an exquisitely saturated blue photonic colors being made all in, all in that one thing. And, and of course we have. Uh, there are, you know, thousands of species that do maybe not such, such elaborate, but but, but similar things. Thanks a lot.